Panama. And those of you who know Phil know that he loves people, especially children. And during the Panama trip, he helped out in the skits a bit. You know what this is, don't you? Part of the time, he played the part of Moses. Another time, Samson. This will stick with a kid's memory. It really, really will. And uh, you know, the kids loved him. Phil's dad, Pat, was also there to help keep him under control to some degree, if at all possible. I don't know. He did a tremendous job with that. We really uh, appreciated working with him, being with both of them. And it was a great, uh, great time to spend with these two godly men. We appreciate the work they do for the Lord. And our theme for the summer series, of course, is the Bible by the Numbers. And tonight, Phil is going to talk to us about the feeding of the 5,000. Phil? I warned you in Panama I was going to do that. You did. I did. This is that remote for that. Thank you. And, uh, is that on now? Okay, good question. All right, make sure. <coughs> Am I on? He's on. Can you hear me? All right, thank you. Good evening. All right, I thought Phil was my friend until I saw that picture posted. You know, I had an equally embarrassing picture of him that I chose not to post yet on Facebook, but it, but it might have to make an appearance. Um, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right. It is, it is good to be with you all. It is wonderful to be here. Um, I live down just down the road, but I don't get over here and, and get to worship and study with you all often enough. But it's, it's certainly great to be here uh, with you tonight. I want you to think about, I got a question for you as we start. What is the most amazing thing that you have ever witnessed? I want you to think about that for a minute. What is the most amazing thing you have ever witnessed? Now, forget for a moment, I don't want you to think about your TV screen or a movie screen, all right? But what is the, what is the most amazing thing you've ever seen uh, with your own two eyes? When you think about your life, uh, what, what stands out to you? If, if somebody asked you tonight, what's the most amazing event you ever witnessed? What's, what's the, just the most uh, powerful thing you've ever seen? What would your answer be? I want you to think about that for a minute. And do you have something in mind? As you think about whatever that is in your life, all right, maybe it was um, the birth of your child. Maybe it was... Um, um, seeing the birth of, of a child in Christ, maybe watching your child uh, be baptized into Christ, maybe, uh, I don't know, it could be any things, and, and I don't know where all you've been and what all you've seen, but when you think about the most amazing thing you've seen in your life, I want to ask you this question. What did you do afterwards? What did you do after that? How many people did you tell? How many people did you share with about this event? Do you remember? If, if you grew up around here, if you've lived around here long, um, you might have heard of the Music City Miracle. Have you ever heard of that? The Music City Miracle. There's a, there's a football team near here called the Tennessee Titans. And... I want to take you back to the summer of 1999. Um, some of us were in college at the time. And if you remember, that was the first year that, that the Titans played in their, in their home stadium where they now play. That was the first year that, that I think the stadium was new. And um, it was our first year playing in our own stadium. And if you remember, it was just kind of a magical year as they go in sports. 
everything just seemed to fall in place. And um, my dad uh, gave me tickets to the, the first playoff game that was ever hosted there. And uh, some of you were probably there. Um, but we played, the Titans played the Bills, and it was a wild card game. But uh, anyway, whether you remember or whether or not, the Titans were down late in the game, and a play happened that was, that was pretty rare. There was, a, there was a crazy kickoff return, and the Titans were able to, to win the game at the end. And ultimately, they would go on to the Super Bowl that year, the only time I guess we've made it. And, uh, of course, we would lose. But um, you, do you all remember that? It was, if you were there, it was really exciting. And they, they nicknamed it the Music City Miracle because it was against all odds and the Titans won and, and everybody that was still in the stadium was rejoicing. Was anybody there? Show of hands. All right. Well, uh, a couple of us were. I was, I was hugging the person next to me who I'd never met before, you know, we're, we're hugging and everybody's celebrating and you feel like you're part of a big family. Um, you've, you may have had moments like this in, in sports or in life, but, but it, was, it was great. And I was, I was about, uh, I don't know, 20 at the time or so. And uh, I was in college. And I'm telling you, what did I do after that game? I was telling everybody about it for the next few weeks. Man, did you see that game? I was there. And I was, I was hugging this guy beside me, and, and I'm probably the reason why they won. and um, Not really, but, you know, I, I could not stop talking about it everywhere I went. Did you see that? I was right there. All right. Have you ever had moments like that? Have you had moments in your life where, where you have to tell somebody about the experience? You know, oh, you should have been there. This is the greatest thing I've ever seen, the greatest thing I've ever witnessed. You know, um, they nicknamed it the, the Music City Miracle, all right? Now, we know, we know uh, that, that, that it wasn't a miracle, but we throw that term around in, in sports sometimes when, when a team is facing long odds. But I want you to think about a time in your life when you witnessed something that just you know, blew you away and, and just, just amazed you. And I want you to think about how often did you talk about that? How many people did you tell about that? Turn, if you will, to John chapter 6. Now, we know, of course, as Christians, that Jesus performed actual miracles, real life, real life miracles that, that no one else could ever duplicate. And we read through, through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see countless times of Jesus doing amazing things that left people speechless and, and that left people talking about it and telling everyone about it um, for, for days and weeks and I'm sure years following. If you will, turn to John chapter 6. You know, when we think about it and put things in perspective, um, my grandmother would always remind me, you know, son, sports really aren't that important, all right? And, and, you know, that was, that was just a game, right? But here when we read in John 6, this is, this is real life. And, and when we look at the feeding of the 5,000, this miracle that Jesus did, you, you can read about this in, in any of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. I, I've chosen John tonight, and I'll, and I'll share with you why in the next few minutes. But isn't that neat that this was recorded Four different times in the Bible. And you imagine, I want you to imagine tonight being there, that, that you were one of the 5,000 that, that ate that day. Or maybe that you were one of the disciples that were with Jesus that witnessed this firsthand right up close. I know you're familiar with the story, but, but let's read it. And as we read this, I want you to imagine that you're there. Maybe you've read this story many times, you've studied this many times, but I want you to try to look at it with, with new eyes and, and, and consider it and try to put yourself in, in the shoes um, or, or the sandals of those people that were there. 
Let's read together. John 6, verse 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that, are, that remain, so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. When we think about what these people just witnessed, and you try to imagine being there that day and partaking of, of this feast of bread and fish. Try to put yourselves in their shoes. You know, all they had to feed over 5,000 people was five loaves of bread and two small fish. It, it was impossible. When you look at it, in, in verse 5, Jesus asked Philip, where they could buy bread to feed the people. Verse 6 says that, that Jesus was testing them because he already knew what he would do. But Philip responds in verse 7 by saying that 200 denarii worth of bread would not be sufficient for them, that every one of them could have a little. Now, a, a denarius in these times, uh, from what I've read, uh, was a day's wage for a laborer um, during these times. Uh, it would be the equivalent of about $72.50 today would be one denarii. So 200 denarii would be the equivalent today of, of $14,500. And, and Philip said that, that even, even that much, even buying that much bread would not be enough to feed all these people where, where everybody could just have a little bit. Now the reason I love John's account of this event is, is verse 8 and 9. This is something that's, that's different from the other accounts. And, and, and I love verse 8 and 9. And I, and I want us to consider that tonight. Who speaks up here? In verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, who's, who's most famous for being Simon Peter's brother, he said to him, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But I want you to listen to this and consider this. But what does he ask Jesus? He says, here's a boy that has five loaves and two fish. But what does he ask him? He says, but what are they among so many? But what are they among so many? I want you to think about that. Here, here Andrew speaks up. He says to Jesus, Jesus, here we, we have a, a young boy that has five loaves and two fishes. But he even asks out loud, 
but, but what are they among so many? In other words, how... We have five loaves and two fish, but how could that possibly feed all the disciples, much less 5,000 people that are here, that are hungry? Jesus responded to his question. He said, have the people sit down. Make the people sit down. And you know, he took the loaves, Jesus did, and when he had given thanks... He distributed them to the disciples, and they, they distributed to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. The Bible says that all ate and were filled. Then afterwards, he said, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. And they gathered them up, and there were 12 baskets remaining. There were, there were, there were 12 baskets that were full of the fragments of the loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Imagine yourself there. Imagine yourself here watching this, witnessing what, what Jesus did and what the disciples helped Him do. I, I believe there are many lessons we can take away from, from this account, from this event. And I would encourage you to read all the accounts in, in, in all the Gospels. I think you can read this many times and that there's many lessons you can take away that you can apply to your life. But the reason I chose to look at John chapter 9, to look at John's account, is because I want to focus our attention on verse 8 and 9. Here is Andrew. We don't know a lot about Andrew. We read a lot more about about Peter, about James and John. I always think of Andrew um, early on because we know that he brought his brother to Jesus, that he brought Simon Peter to Christ. But we don't know a lot about Andrew. But why would he speak up there? He, he spoke up and, he's, and he said, Jesus, here's, here's a boy that has five loaves and two fish. But I want, to, I want us to focus on, on verse 9. What does that sound like to you? As he asked Jesus, but what are they among so many? What, what do you think Andrew was thinking? What, what do you think? Do you think he or any of the disciples had any idea what Jesus was about to do? You, you know, sometimes... Uh, when you speak up, you don't know what somebody's reaction is going to be. And, and I wonder what Andrew thought as the words were coming out of his mouth, what Jesus would say to that. How, how does that sound when you read it? To me, he had faith enough in Jesus to offer what he had. But he thought that it wasn't enough. He had faith enough in Christ to, to bring it up and say, here's a boy with five loaves and two fishes. But it, but it seems that there's doubt in his voice and that question, is it really enough? Is it going to make a difference with all these people? I want to encourage us tonight. I, I think there's many lessons you can take away. I encourage you to read this story again, even if you read it many years ago as a child, and consider what we can learn from this. I want to give you three lessons that you can take away from tonight. And I want to encourage you. Number one, and they're all going to be you statements. All right? Number one, you are enough. You are enough. With God on your side, you can do anything. Romans 8.31, you know what it says. Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say then? If God is for us, what? Who can be against us? Right? When I think about that question that, that Andrew asked, think about that question tonight in regards to you and your life in Christ and your faith. 
when he asked, here's five loaves and two fishes, but, but what are they among so many? Maybe when you think about your life as a Christian, your role in the Lord's kingdom, your role in the Lord's church, in this congregation right here, do you ever, do you ever look at yourself and say, you know, who, who am I among so many? I, I want to challenge you tonight to remember that you are enough. You are enough. I think sometimes as, as, as humans, sometimes we look at ourselves in the mirror and we look at ourselves and, and we see what is lacking. Do you do that? Maybe we look at other people and, and we say, well, I can't, I can't preach like him. I can't, I can't teach a class like, like her, like she does. And, and maybe, maybe we undervalue ourselves and we say, what, what can I really do? All right? But I want to encourage you. You are enough. God was able, Jesus was able to take five loaves and two fish. Not much. He was able to take that and feed 5,000 people that day. What can, what can God do with you? What can, what can God do with, with you in His kingdom today, in 2018? You are enough. God can use you to make a difference in this world in your job, in your school, in your neighborhood, in your community, in this church. I want you to remember, you are enough. Don't, don't look in the mirror and say, you know, I, I'm not as talented as this other person. I don't have the ability of somebody else. Alright, look at yourself and say, what can I do for God? What can God use me to do? I am enough. You are enough. I heard once, uh, you know, sometimes you, you feel like maybe you're in the minority in this world, in this crazy, uh, this crazy nation we live in right now. But, but you and God are a majority. With, with, with God's help, we know that nothing is, nothing is impossible. You can make a difference in the life of somebody maybe in the lives of many somebodies, all right, if, if, you're, if you're open to that. Andrew, Andrew could have kept his mouth shut. And, and you see, none of the other disciples were speaking up. You know, Philip said, well, if we had 200 denarii, we could, we could buy food, but, but that wouldn't even feed everybody here, all right? But nobody else even had the faith to speak up. But here Andrew says, here's five loaves and two fish. What is that among so many? But Jesus was able to take that, just that little bit of faith, and say, I can use that. And he was able to do something miraculous and, and feed all these people. But I want you to remember tonight three things. Number one, you are enough. You are enough. Don't sit back and say, well, I'll, 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 let, I'll let this person do all the preaching. I'll let this person do all the teaching. I'll let this person do all the serving. All right? You are valuable. You are a valuable part of the Lord's church. And you are enough. And I, and I, I promise you that there is something right now there is a way right now that you can be serving God in your life if you're not already doing so. God can use you and, and your strengths and your weaknesses to make an impact in this world for, for, for God. Number two is similar to that. Number two, you are valuable. You are valuable. Use the talents that you have for God's glory. Alright? God has, God has brought you into this world. God has put you where you are for a reason. Use the abilities that God has given you for His glory. 
we all have different talents, but, but we all are important. Each part of the body is important. You are important to God. You make a difference in the Lord's church. There is only one you. When you look around this congregation, you look at each other, it's, the design of the church is so beautiful. We all have different roles, but we're all important. You can read Romans chapter 12, and you can read 1 Corinthians 12, where God talks about we are part of one body. We know the body has, has different parts, and we have different purposes, but we're all part of one body, one church. And each of us needs to be doing our part, doing what we can to further the gospel, to, to, to help grow the kingdom. What are you doing for God? Turn over, if you will, to Romans chapter 12 as you think about this. And, and I'd love for you to read um, 1 Corinthians 12 on your own. I'm sure you've read these before, but, but look at Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 3. He says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. You are valuable. You are a valuable part of the Lord's church. You are a valuable part of this body. And if you've ever had parts of your body go out, uh, I broke my foot a few months back, and I never realized how essential your foot is till you try to get around with a broken foot. If you've ever had a part of your body that's hurting, you know how tough it is, right? We as a church, every one of us needs to pull our weight. We need, to, we need to say to God, you know, here I am, what can I do for you? When I think about this, um, how many of y'all have ever been on a, a mission trip out of the country of the United States? All right, Many of you have. I, I, know, I know many of you have been to Brazil. I know many of you have been to Honduras and Panama. Um, Phil mentioned we were just in Panama a couple weeks ago. I think... It's a beautiful thing to go on a mission trip. Um, the, the trip we had in Panama, we were doing a medical mission trip. And it, it's just, it's so beautiful. And it's, to me, it's like Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 personified because you see all these different roles. And we had, we had a doctor and we had a pharmacist and we had nurses and physical therapists and we had, um, we had Bible classes and Everyone was doing their role. And you look at it and you say, well, I'm not qualified to do this, but I am qualified to do this. I have a role here. And, and every part of those, um, just a couple weeks ago, we watched as, as 19 people uh, were baptized into Christ and four were restored to the Lord. And every job on that team was a part of bringing souls to Christ. And you would see people who had come through and gotten medical attention and been, been treated and cared for, and then they would sit down and study the Bible with someone, and they would be baptized. And every, every part is functioning. Every, every part of the body is helping to bring souls to Jesus. And it was so beautiful to watch. Um, i, I got to share this with you. Um, tonight. Um, I'm thankful that uh, uh, my sister Sue McPherson could be here and her friend uh, Hubert Young. They usually worship with the Rivergate congregation not too far from here. But Miss Sue uh, has been on many trips with me and, and Miss Kay Randolph was, was with us a couple weeks ago and, and we've been together as well. These ladies do a wonderful job teaching the children's Bible class. 
And that's something, you saw me. I mean, that's about all I can do. I can, I can put on a wig and try to flex and look like Samson or Moses. But these ladies were really doing the work. I, you know, I could cut up with the kids and try to make them laugh. But um, seriously, these, these ladies do such a terrific job. And i got to share this with you. Every night, we would have a gospel meeting. So we're down in the country of Panama, and we're at this school, and we're inside a little gymnasium. And we would have preaching going on in Spanish. And my favorite moment from the week that we were down there was I was sitting there and I was listening to the preacher. And in Panama especially, preachers tend to go, to go long. They're a little more long-winded. They don't have a bell that rings at 740. I may need to get that installed down there. But, um, but they, they get excited. They're preaching and they want to continue to preach. Well, this was so special. On this night, he preached a powerful lesson from God's Word. And over 20 people came forward asking for prayers. And it was just a very emotional night, and, and, and you could tell the Word of God had impacted the hearts of the people. I don't know why, but I was sitting on the front row, and I was listening to this sermon, and, and it had been a powerful message. And th there were doors right behind where he was preaching. And there was another gym, uh, an outdoor covered gym, uh, where they would have the children's classes. And so, after a while... Um, it's harder to, to deal with children than I think adults a lot of times. So after a while, he had preached too long, and the kids started coming through the door, coming back to find their parents, you know. But I want you to know, it was one of my favorite moments, because every child that would come through that door, I was sitting where you are, facing the pulpit, every child that would come through would have a smile from ear to ear. And they'd be holding their crafts and they'd be holding their coloring sheets and, and, and whatever these ladies had given them to help remember that Bible lesson that night. And I just, I almost started crying. I really did. Because I saw these precious little children. And, and I told the ladies, I said, these kids will never forget when you came to their community and shared the love of God with them and shared stories from God's Word. It was a community that not many people from the USA come visit there on a regular basis. And I guarantee you, they will never forget the lessons that these ladies taught and, and the impact that they had on their life. Um, you, you are valuable. There is something, you may already be doing it, but there is something you can be doing in the Lord's church right now. There's something you can be doing in your neighborhood, in your office, in your school that makes an impact on somebody that can help bring someone to Jesus. The way you live, the way you love, the way you carry yourself at work, you can make a difference in somebody's life. You are enough. You are valuable. The last one is... You are a servant. You are a servant. I'm not asking you. You are a servant. We are here as Christians, and we want to serve God. We want to serve God. I want to encourage you in your life to have the attitude of, of Isaiah the prophet. You remember in Isaiah 6, verse 8, you remember what it said? Isaiah said, Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And you remember what Isaiah said? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. I want to encourage you. Have that attitude with, with, with God, before God. Say to the Lord, Here am I, what can I do for you? What, what can I do to help the kingdom grow? To help spread the gospel? To help um, bring the lost to Christ? I know that there are people in Lebanon that are lost.
There are people that live right around us, right here in Wilson County, that need the Lord, that don't know the Lord. All right, what can you do to serve? What can you do um, to help make the difference in the lives of others? All right, I want to encourage you be a servant, serve God. So, as we think tonight, as you think about the miracle of feeding 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. I want you to consider the question that Andrew asked and think about that this week. What did he say? Here's five loaves and two fishes, but what are they among so many? If you ever doubt yourself, if you ever doubt that you have a role, that you have abilities and talents you can use, I want to encourage you to remember those three things. You are enough. You are valuable. You are a servant. In Matthew 25, you remember the parable of the talents. Something I think about all the time. And you remember it. The, a man went away and he called his servants to him. And he gave one five talents. He gave one two talents. He gave one one talent. Do you remember that? And the one with five went and worked and multiplied it and had ten talents when his master returned. And the one with two talents went and, and traded and, and multiplied and, and had four talents when his, when his master returned. But you remember, what did the one with one talent do? He took it and buried it. I want to encourage you tonight. You know yourself. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Whether you feel like God has given you five talents or two talents or one talent, I want to encourage you. Use your talents for God. Use your talents. All right? Use your abilities in the Lord's church. God can use you, every one of us. All right? And I want to encourage you when, you, when you read in that story, Matthew 25, I know we're out of time if this clock is right, but do you remember what did the master say to the servants who took their talents and multiplied him? I want God to be able to say this to you one day and to me. What did He say in Matthew 25? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You are enough. You are valuable. You are a servant. I want to encourage you to have faith and say to God, here I am. Use me. Use me. And let's serve God with all our ability. Alright? Um, let's pray together. Our Father in Heaven, we love You so much. And Father, we thank You for um, this lesson we find in Your Word. Father, we thank You for Your Son Jesus. We thank You for, for this occasion in John chapter 6. And Father, I, I pray that um, we may take the lessons from it and apply it to our life. Father, I pray that You will encourage each one of us, that You will be with each one of us and help us to always have faith in You and to always serve You. And remember, Father, that You have purpose for us, that, that You've given us abilities and talents. Help us to always use them for You and to bring glory to You. And, and Father, that we might um, bring the lost to You. Father, I pray that You'll be with us, be with this congregation. Help us to always be about good works. Always be about Your work, Father. And, and may this congregation continue to grow um, in their faith and joy and love and, and, um, and also in number, Father. All these things, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. About toddler age to, uh, to, to 18 or so. And, and Oscar's a 16-year-old boy in our children's home. And um, I had been around Oscar a lot the last few months, especially the first few months this year. And um, he was one of those teenagers. I don't know if you're ever around teenagers like this. He was kind of hard for me to figure out. Uh, sometimes he would 
Sometimes he would seem to be real positive and upbeat, and then sometimes he'd seem to be kind of moody and you didn't know what was going on with him. But um, one thing that was really neat, my friend Sarah Dutton that works with our children's home, she brought some of our kids over uh, to help with us during the campaign. Uh, we were working here in, in a community called uh, Las Margaritas in Chepo, and it's about 45 minutes from our preaching school and our children's home. Well, she would bring these children over, and, um, or these teenagers, and they would go out evangelizing. They would join our, our teams and do Bible studies with people. Um, and this was so neat. Uh, and I want you to think about opportunities you have in life. My dad, this was his first time coming to Panama. And Sarah brought Oscar over to my dad. And she said, I want him to go with you on Bible studies, outdoor knocking. And, I, and, and, and she told Oscar, I just want you to shadow him. I want you to learn and be part of it. And so they did. And, and my, dad, my dad and Oscar, you know, my dad who's uh, about to be 67, um, and this 16-year-old boy, they just, they just clicked. They just, um, my dad's really good at that with most people, but they, they just hit it off. And they spent all day together in houses studying the Bible with people. And my dad said, son, it was funny. You know, after the first house or two, Oscar would be speaking up and giving people his advice and, you know, his uh, thoughts on the scripture they were reading or whatever. Um, but, uh, but they just really hit it off. And I, and I never forget, we got back, well, they got back from door knocking and, and we were kind of wrapping up our clinic for the day. And I look back on this back wall, um, you know, way back behind these guys in that soccer goal, and I saw my dad and Oscar sitting there talking. And, and I knew something was up. And I said, I said, you know, I'm interested to see what happens. And I saw them talking for a long time, just the two of them. And uh, a few minutes later, my dad walked by. I was on the other side of the gym. And, and my dad said, son, uh, Oscar has decided to, to be baptized. And, um, and, and so I, I go over, this is not a great picture, but um, this was the only picture I got of the act of, baptiz the act of baptism of Oscar. This is Oscar, uh, my dad baptizing him, and here he is afterwards. Um, this is Oscar in the, in the blue scrub top. And um, I just, I want you to think about it. My dad said, as they were studying... They, were, they had been talking about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And you know that story in, in Acts chapter 8. And you know ultimately, after Philip preached Christ to him, what did the eunuch ask him? He said, here's water. What, what hinders me from being baptized? And my dad said, that's exactly what Oscar did. They had spent all day studying. And finally he looked at my dad and said, there's no reason I can't be baptized right now. There's water right over here. And, and so my dad baptized him. Um, that's Sarah in the middle that works for the children's home. And Jaime uh, in the purple is another preacher in Panama. And he and my dad were both spending a lot of time with Oscar. Um, but I want you to realize, and, and you know this, but when you know what the Bible teaches... And when you know what you need to do to be saved, there's nothing that should stop you from doing that. And, and this just, you know, somehow God's providence led to this boy coming to help us and, and my dad and them meeting and them studying. But when he, when he knew, when he read what God's Word says, you know, he said, I need to be baptized right now for the washing away of my sins. And he was. And, um, and I want you to consider that tonight. There's no reason to put off till tomorrow what you know you need to do right now. And we know what God's Word says. John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And we know what, what Jesus commanded. In John 8, 24, 
John 8, 24, Jesus said, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. We must believe with all our heart that Jesus is the Son of God. We know that Jesus said in Luke 13, verse 3, He said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Do you believe in God with all your heart? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent of your sins? Turn your back on, on that life, on the old life, and put, put to death your old self and follow God? Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, Therefore, whoever confesses Me before men, him will I also confess before My Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies Me before men... Him I, him I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Are you ready to repent of your sins? Are you ready to confess before God and before witnesses your faith in Christ? And we know what, what Jesus said in Mark 16, 16. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be condemned. If you believe in God with all your heart, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Are you ready to repent? Repent of your sins. Are you ready to confess Christ? Confess your faith before men. And are you ready to be baptized into water, into Christ, to have your sins washed away? I saw two weeks ago a man that was 90 years old that said, I need to be baptized. And I saw a young man that was 16 years old that says, this is what the Bible says. This is what I need to do. Here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? That's the question for you tonight. If you need to obey the gospel, do so tonight. Maybe, maybe you're a Christian, but you need the prayers of the church. Um, maybe, you, maybe you've been struggling lately. Maybe you need to ask forgiveness from God and ask the church to pray for you. I know that this church would love to pray with you and pray for you. If you need to respond to the invitation, please do so as we stand, as we sing. Tis the fount of love from the source above, and He bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me.